One member of the Public Service Commission, Lynn Greer, says regardless of the outcome of the rate increase request, the customers of South Central Bell will foot the bill, either in the form of higher rates each month or in reduced services. He says even if the full amount of the request is granted, some customer services will be reduced. We could uh, uh, look at directory assistance, which we are looking at, and uh, you know you get five, five free uh, calls per month. We could abolish those. Uh, we could go to the telephone, pay telephone and put on some sort of charge for directory assistant there. These are all places that you could put uh, charges where the people who's using that particular service would pay for it. On the other hand, phone company district manager Stuart Stevenson says if Bell doesn't get the higher rates, the customers will pay in other ways. The alternatives may be canceling some programs or deferring programs, spreading your construction program out. It may uh, result in somewhat slower response time to customer request. Even before a final decision is made, Commissioner Greer and fellow Commissioner Jim Folsom, Jr. say they don't anticipate the company being granted the full amount. The commission has until August 4th to make that final decision. Terry Stanton, WSFA TV News. This is John Henderson's produce supply business. For the past five months, the business has served as a temporary home for 58-year-old Grace Murdoch and her two adult children. Uh, they had no clothes, no money, no means of, uh, well, no means of survival, actually. They had no place to sleep, no place to take a bath, and no clothes to change to. No work and no hope of work because their appearance was such, because of the clothes and so forth, that uh, looking for work would have been a very, very difficult thing to find. Jack Murdoch, who says he is a Vietnam-era veteran, has a job at the produce company, and there is enough room at the facility for him to stay indefinitely. But Grace and Charlotte Murdoch say they have had trouble getting back on their feet. They're looking for a job, and had not been able to find one. And uh, when I can try and go back to work and find me on pop my own, it would be a lot better. The women are angry about recent reports that they have turned down offers of help from various agencies, and they say they are grateful for all the help they have received. I appreciate it, love, very much. I'm thankful for it. I'm grateful. And I know the Lord will bless them for it. Meanwhile, Charlotte Murdoch says she's trying to prepare for her GED so she can regain her independence. Lynn Sampson, WSFA TV News. Even though the minimum pay bill was signed into law in late May, Houston County deputies have been waiting for the extra money. The reason the county commission questioned the legislature's right to raise salaries for county employees. The commission asked its state association to see if the legislature could overstep the authority of the local personnel board. That's the answer the came at today's personnel board meeting. There's no question in my mind the legislature you know, has done this uh, and uh, we got to abide by it. The personnel board unanimously approved the retroactive raises. County Commission Chairman Charles Whitten says the commission agrees with this. He assured the personnel board the new law does not strip its power. It does not really affect your position. Uh, it orders you to do this, but it doesn't affect your position at all as far as any other business is concerned. But today's action does not affect five jailers with the sheriff's department. While the personnel board says the new law does not apply to these people, Houston County's sheriff says otherwise. It doesn't say deputies, it says all law enforcement personnel who has uh, qualified under the minimum standards uh, will be paid not less than $1,300 a month. Haddon predicts the jailers will go to court if the raises don't come through. Cal Calloway, WSFA TV News, Dothan. Love and God and endurance. You have to and working together to make it a success because we were both such children. I've heard I never have heard her say anything about divorce, but I have heard her say about murder. <laughs> I would do that right now sometime. <laughs>
special for the symphony. It's, it's as lousy as the options at church. I feel quite honored because it's doing something very, very good. And win, lose, or draw, the money that we collect for it. Any way you can raise this money, fine. If it's illegal, call me. <laughs> <laughs> We are covering every facet relative to alcoholism and drug abuse that has become an epidemic in the United States, in our state, and in our community. We're covering awareness. We're trying to make society aware of the problem, the magnitude of the problem. We're also covering prevention, intervention, treatment, aftercare, as well as employee assistance programs for industry. Almost six weeks after federal judge Myron Thompson struck down part of the department's policy on when to fire a gun, the department has brought its policy in line with the judge's ruling. Shift commanders have told their officers they cannot shoot unless their life or a citizen's life is threatened. Before we had the luxury to decide for ourselves if we reasonably believe somebody, if they escaped, would in, in, in effect down the road harm somebody and cause serious bodily injury. We don't have that uh, luxury anymore. We almost have to wait until somebody's in imminent danger until something happens. The decision stems from a 1982 incident where a former policeman shot and wounded a Montgomery teenager. Both sides head back to court this week for a trial to determine how much, if any, money the city owes the teenager. And we feel like once that the uh, statement of the officer in this particular situation is, is considered and looked at closely, they will see that he felt like all along that his life was in immediate danger. He said so. The major the makes it clear the department considers the change in policy to be only temporary, meaning the police want and expect Judge Thompson's ruling to be overturned. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. Employees. Thought of Hanshaw Army Heliport. This base consists of 15. He'll now reposition for you to view him following our presentation. Let's have a hand for our demonstrator. Notice how the aircraft leaves the ground, almost vertical here. This aircraft is going to demonstrate for you on a very small scale. Now, upon completion, he will also reposition for status and flight after the demonstration. Tonight, we will dedicate this park to all the soldiers who have lived here for some time that wanted somewhere for all these fine young ladies and young men to play. And we will break this ground in memory of them. Now my issue here is what? Quality education. You know that. We don't have to keep on stressing that. People have been saying all the people over in Hainwood, they are just concerned about Hainwood. They don't care about the rest of the county. That's not true. We are concerned about quality education, and we fear that quality education can start right here in Hainwood. We spent over $300,000.
back to the outline of the agenda. He's going this way, or he's going to go that way. Linebacker don't know which way he's going. Auburn assistant coach Bud Casey and other members of the Tiger coaching staff have been instructing high school coaches from across the state this week on everything from the wishbone to linebacking play the Auburn way. We run the wishbone and we've visited Auburn a lot before, but every time you come you find out something that you didn't find out you know, on previous trips. Every time I come to a clinic and our coaches, we can, if we can go back with one, with one thing that we picked up, we feel like it's been beneficial. And Sporting good manufacturers have seized the opportunity to show off their goods, which include the latest in jerseys and headgear. Shoulder pads, footballs, and footwear are also on display. Football shoes haven't changed much, but basketball shoes sure have. And if Tom Landry can use computers, why can't high school coaches? The uh, particular school football team can uh, scout their, their opponent for the upcoming week and plot by using the computer uh, their opponent's tendencies. Tonight at 10, a visit with the A2A All-Stars and at least one All-Star coach. Dave Cody, WSFA TV Sports. The best part of the day for me is during the game because there are no distractions. You know, before and after, they're, they're wondering if my job is safe. Uh, and it's really out of my control right now, so I'm just concerned about winning and trying to win a pennant. Start up with two reads. Five, two reads. Five, two reads. Right. To borrow a lyric from the Charlie Daniels band, if the South is going to do it again, it will be in part because of a 6'3", 230-pound running back by the name of Leo Jolly. The Bama-bound ball carrier ran for more than 1,400 yards at Arrington. Yes, he can throw, too. Run the wishbone, you know. Never run it before, but, you know, I've done it to pretty good with practicing and all. To answer the inevitable, where's the beef, one need only to look at the South offensive line, which averages 247 pounds a man. We just... Grown, grown close, and we'll, we'll probably remember this the rest of our life, and all of them good ball players. Montgomery's Desmond Matthews and Clyde Perkins, teammates at St. Jude, are part of the South defensive front, which averages 213 pounds. This is me and Desmond last game, and we're trying to go out. This is our best game ever. How long y'all been playing again? Oh, about ever since about the fourth grade. Coffee Springs' Ronnie Green has a leg up on the place kicking duties. But the All-America defensive back is just glad he can contribute. The ones that work harder, the ones that's going to come out on top of the end. We'll let you go back to work. All right. There is little for honorary coaches to do but prognosticate and spectate until game time, especially when the head coach is Paul Woolley of Brantley, who seems to have matters under control. You got a 20 and out on him. He's going nine out and flat. You got a backside drag after a two block. Take the big man on the draw and you pick up backside in, you pick up on side in. Hope you got that. First down, first down. Kickoff is 7 o'clock Friday night at Jordan Hare Stadium. The NCAA is uh, interested in uh, showing a uh, profitable World Series, and, and that hasn't happened in, in Riverside. The facilities have been good, but the attendance has not been good, uh, quite unlike uh, the Division I World Series, which is played in Omaha, where attendance has been excellent. We would like to find a community that wants to support Division II baseball, and I think if that would be in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, we'd be interested in coming here. When I was up here in the spring, Troy High School coming up, my son on it, and I was, uh, attendance has done well. Myself, I feel good about it. I know the committee must receive their recommendation, Coach Nishwich, and when he gets back off his visitation, but uh, if I were a betting man, uh, I'd bet some good money that uh, things would go our way. I hope so, at least. Riverside, it's, I've been out to Riverside. We've been fortunate enough to go out there three times, and I've seen the interest declined over the past three years out there, Phil. It's not, uh, I didn't seem to have the same interest it had the first couple of years we were out there. And uh, I think something like here in, uh, in the state of Alabama, we get this and it'd, it'd really do baseball good. With one out. 
yeah. was thinking about. And there's no explanation for it because it's not even close. One out. Breaking ball, and he drives it into deep left center. Back goes Murphy to the wall. Gone. And there's one loop to Sato. Landro will make the catch. Comments is going to come to the plate, and the throw is up the line. So Hubbard picks his man up as he hits it at Landro. Holding at second is Perry representing the tying run. And the Dodgers lead two to one. With more delegations arriving into the two Olympic villages today, most of the teams that will compete in the 23rd Olympiad have arrived in Los Angeles. This evening, Mayor Phil Brubaker of the USC Village welcomed members of the United States Olympic team. And the excitement is growing by the hour. And with the arrival of the U.S. team in our village, the excitement is reaching a fever pitch. Three other foreign teams were welcomed at the USC facility. Both villages expect more than 5,000 residents during the two-week event. Jack Gregory, NBC News, Los Angeles. It's teaching me new things that I didn't know before. What kind of new things? Um, twirling arm on the arms and twirling around the neck and twirling and turning around. Right now, preparations are underway to make this three-day event something special. State and county farm bureaus are sponsoring the conference, which will emphasize research and marketing. Uh, a lot of times farmers have been good growers and poor marketers, and so we've been continually trying to give our farmers some expertise in how to market their product once they've raised it. By tomorrow, the Farm Bureau expects around 1,200 farmers will be here. Many already are, including these pork producers and their auxiliary, the Porkettes. Some porkettes dished up their county prize winning pork recipes for this afternoon's state cook-off. Cook-offs, booths, research, tours, and seminars. There's a common thread here, the exchange of information and ideas between commodity experts and the producers of the most economically important southern commodities. Lynn Sampson, WSFA TV News. It's easy to spot the boys in blue, and now detectives can be identified by their gray slacks, blue blazer uniform, but going unrecognized is what undercover work is all about, and what makes the stakes so high. The general consensus is that undercover work is the most dangerous. First, you're putting yourself in a situation where there's no police officers to back you up. The lieutenant won't say just how many undercover police officers are on the street. Anyway, the numbers change every day. Lieutenant Hankins says his undercover officers must use common sense and try not to get into situations where they can't get help fast. But a lot of time that's not Back. possible in, in narcotics work. You, uh, you read about major drug busts all over the country and you'll always find that they're heavily armed. They're not worried about getting apprehended. Yeah. Lieutenant Hankins says his officers won't or can't forget the death of Officer Mary McCord. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. This would require double liners, that there have to be liners put in it. These are either metal or some plastic or some type of liners that will help contain it where it can't wash out. It requires double liners. It requires also a leak collection system where there couldn't be leaks to get out into the underground water. It has a groundwater monitoring system, a number of details. We required that these had to be strictly enforced in the state of Alabama.
President Reagan wound up his two-day trip in Hoboken, New Jersey, just 15 miles from Geraldine Ferraro's home. With Hoboken's most famous citizen, he attended the Festival of St. Anne's, the patron saint of mothers. He worked the crowd, signing hundreds of autographs. He won a prize at a carnival booth and joined parishioners in a spaghetti dinner. St. Anne's Parish is an ideal place to seek blue-collar, ethnic, Catholic votes, and candidate Reagan was less stand, than subtle about it. We are for life and against abortion. We are... <laughs> We are for prayer in the schools. We are for tuition tax credits. President Reagan criticized the Democrats' position on the same issues and got straight to the point of his visit. And I have no reservations about throwing my candidacy on the mercies of the good people of St. Anne's Church in Hoboken, New Jersey, and asking them to give the kid a chance. You know, alcoholism is the number one killer in our nation when you take into consideration all the highway deaths as well as the natural co deaths caused from alcoholism. Joe Meadows works with alcoholics at the Haven in Dothan, and he has a lot in common with Father Joseph Martin from Maryland, who's an internationally known consultant on alcoholism. So this is a sickness that affects every single facet of the human person and those who live with it. Both men know about alcoholism from first-hand experience. They're both recovered alcoholics. Father Martin underwent seven months of treatment, but he says before that treatment could begin, he had to come to grips with his problem. All it takes is the goodwill, the willingness, the open-mindedness, the honesty, and everything else on our part to admit that we're human and that we do need help. Father Martin stresses family involvement. He says when a person becomes an alcoholic, his whole family gets sick, and the whole family needs treatment. It's because of his outstanding record in treating this problem that he's been invited to join a long list of speakers in Dothan for the next three days, all dealing with the same topic, beating alcohol and drugs. Our primary purpose for this, council, for this, for this conference is to make our society aware of the magnitude of this problem, the epidemic proportions of alcoholism and drug abuse in our society today. Mary Beth Boyd, WSFA TV News, Dothan. The bill that was passed last night puts the Congress on record as stating that they believe it's very valuable for students who are in a secondary level to be able to pray or engage in any type of religious discussion or Bible study after class hours or before class hours on the same basis that young Republicans or young Democrats or any other group could meet and discuss an issue. Hundreds of police officers from all across the state were in attendance for the memorial protests on the Capitol grounds. They were here to bring attention to the outcome of appeals of the man who was convicted of killing Officer Mary McCord of Montgomery on January 5, 1982. Among the speakers was Chief Charles Swindle of the Montgomery Police Department. In combating this cancer of drugs in our state, it's necessary for police officers to work undercover. And this ruling says to the drug dealers, if it's just you and the officer, shoot the officer and swear you didn't know he was a police officer. If you get caught, you can just say, I didn't realize he was an officer, and who is left to dispute the claim? Even our liberal federal courts do not require the assailant know the victim was an officer. We feel that the law is written by the legislature is correct and as they intended. We also feel that the people of this state want the drug dealers and other criminals off the streets and that they want the courts to reflect this in their decisions and rulings. As another part of his warning about the dangers of police enforcement in the state of Alabama and across the state, Swindle said 37 of the 79 officers killed in the line of duty in 1983 were from the South. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News at the state capitol. We 
um, we've run some pretty good times, but uh, all the practice this morning was in traffic and all, and you can't tell in traffic how fast you can run by yourself. So. Kale Yarbrough's Waddell Wilson prepared Chevrolet had dominated qualifying at the Alabama International Motor Speedway. Yarbrough had driven the Henry Rainier racing machine to three straight pole position. Even though his fastest official practice lap this week was under 200 miles an hour, Yarbrough was still considered the driver to beat. And he lived up to those expectations, turning in a lap at better than 202 miles an hour to shatter his own Talladega 500 qualifying record. The South Carolina driver was one of six drivers to break the 200 mile an hour barrier. Bill Elliott, who has won two poles already this year, missed a third by a bumper as he also turned in a lap at more than 202 miles an hour. Terry Labonte looked to have the inside position on row two locked up until defending Talladega 500 champion Dale Earnhardt here bumped into the outside with a lap at more than 201 miles an hour. Tommy Ellis qualified fifth, Buddy Baker sixth, and Darrell Waltrip, the only two-time winner of the Talladega 500, qualified seventh. We're not as fast as some of the others, but we never are. The fastest car very seldom wins this race. Cale Yarbrough has led qualifying for the Talladega 500 twice before, but he has yet to win the race. In fact, out of the 15 races, there have been 14 different winners. Cale Yarbrough might make it 15 out of 16. At the Alabama International Motor Speedway, Dave Cody, WSFA TV Sports. Recently, the Environmental Protection Agency determined that workers in the nation's capital receive slightly more radiation than normal due to naturally occurring radioactive material in the granite, which after a complex series of events eventually releases radon gas. This discovery has prompted the governor's office in South Carolina to ask for help from the EPA laboratory in Montgomery to find out if there are increased levels of radon gas in the granite state capitol building at Columbia. The Eastern Environmental Radiation Facility in Montgomery is providing air samplers and analysis, not only to South Carolina, but to other agencies around the U.S. Several nations, uh, the United States, Sweden, Czechoslovakia, Great Britain, and countries have done um, large epidemiology studies to determine the risk associated with radon. And it's been determined that there's a much greater risk of cancer uh, due to higher levels of radon. The process of detecting radon gas and the radioactive particles it emits is relatively new. So one of the biggest jobs at the EPA lab is developing and testing various radon monitors. But large granite government buildings aren't the only concern of the EPA when it comes to radon gas. Newer, more conventional buildings, especially those designed to be extremely energy efficient, can also be traps for any naturally occurring radon gas coming out of the soil. All this research will eventually help to establish a national standard for radiation exposure from radon gas. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News. They were doing a good job, but the Cale Yarbrough won the pole for the third straight time at the Alabama International Motor Speedway, breaking his own Talladega 500 qualifying record with a lap at more than 202 miles an hour. You know, we're just going to do our best shot, or give it our best shot. Waddell's got this Hardy Chevrolet running good for us, and uh, whether it's good enough, we just have to wait and see. We just do the best we can. Bill Elliott, who has won two pole positions already this year, also turned in a lap at better than 202 to claim the outside position on row one. The inside position on row two goes to Dale Earnhardt, who took the checkered flag first a year ago. Terry Labonte qualified fourth fastest, but the surprise of the first day qualifying was Tommy Ellis, who's yet to finish in the top 10, but qualified fifth fastest today. Bobby Allison, the leader of the Alabama gang, qualified a disappointing 17th. But family and friends appear to be the top priority for the Hueytown driver. It's always hectic around the house and the shop, as well as here at the racetrack. But, uh, you know, it, it's not bad. Uh, it's something that we've learned to live with, and uh, we look forward to it even. Indianapolis driver A.J. Foyt was on the bubble as the final qualifier on day one. But that's certainly not a position he's in touch on the Indy circuit. I guess come race day, it, it really, a lot of factors involved besides just speed. What it really is is trying to handle all day and where you can set up your car to draft and all that. So that's mainly what we're working for.
is a uh, class where the judge is actually judging the youngsters and the horse on uh, the way the horse handles. Uh, cert, uh, obstacles are set up there in the ring or markers. Uh, the youngster has to follow a specific pattern that's set down by the American Quarter Horse Association. Uh, they've got to follow it exactly. At different points in this pattern, they must be doing certain gates or the horse must be moving in a certain way in a certain direction. So it really tests the youngster's ability to handle that horse, uh, to give him cues to switch from one gate to the other one, and then, of course, it one lead, uh, to, the other. One lead to the other, and then uh, it tests the kid's ability to handle that horse and the horse's response. And, of course, along with that, you need a real smooth, easy-going horse uh, uh, that will handle the course uh, without uh, very much difficulty. At Mount San Antonio College, a final Olympic track and field warm-up. The big names on the American team chose not to attend. Names like Carl Lewis. He's preparing for his possible four gold medal sweep in private. Lewis's success has bruised some American egos. But if someone can stand up here and talk about other people, then that means they're not thinking about themselves and what they have to do. Edwin Moses hasn't lost a 400-meter hurdles race since 1977. Remain hopeful going in that you come out on top or you can come out where you want to come out or improve or whatever it is that you're going into the race for. American high jump record holder and two-time bronze medalist Dwight Stones back as a competitor for perhaps his last time. The Olympic Games is set up for something like that, for the Cinderella story, for the guy who comes from nowhere, for the girl who has her best day uh, in that event. Evelyn Ashford has been conceded the gold in the women's 100-meter run. The American women sprinters appear to be just as strong as the men. But track and field experts say the boycott will award medals to those that are really second best. For Andy Lascano for NBC News. Mr. Mount kind of went out on a limb because we had the record that he predicted, but we didn't end up number one. I guess I'd settle for the same record right now. I, I would, of course, we're shooting to be 12 and 0, but. Uh, it's nice to be picked up there, and I just hope we're worthy of it. There you go, there you go. We got Leo as well as the rest of the backs. They all, they all good football players, and, and if, we, if the line can come out blocking for them, I believe we can pull it on out. Me and Desmond, um, and then switch defense, and uh, I think if we get a good pass rush and try to get back there with the quarterback, might have a good game going. There was no score in the third inning when Dwight Evans ripped one into the alley in right center field just out of the reach of a diving Rudy Law and all the way to the wall. Jackie Gutierrez comes home. As the throw comes in, Wade Boggs will score. It was 2-0 Boston, and Evans pulled up at third with a triple. Things are just not going well with the White Sox these days. This is Jim Rice with a pop-up in foul territory. Greg Walker goes running over to make the play, but something happened on the way to the ball. A Boston fan got it instead. Then in the fifth inning, leading 3-0, Tony Armas hits a high fly ball down the line and left. Ron Kittle was shading Armas to center field. He couldn't get to the ball. He goes at chasing. Jim Rice headed for the plate. Here comes the relay. Rice slides safely in. The Red Sox led 5-0. Rookie pitcher Roger Clemens, an outstanding performance, striking out 11 White Sox, including this one against Mike Squires to end the game. Roger Clemens with his first Major League shutout, Boston beat Chicago 7-0. This is Scott Clark reporting for NBC News. Alabama's death row inmates are kept here just a few yards from the electric chair downstairs. They were here when John Lewis Evans was electrocuted in the spring of 1982. They spend time reading, watching TV, and thinking about the future, which for them is filled with legal appeals and wondering if the sentence will eventually be carried out. 39-year-old David Nelson faces the chair for murder. He ended up on death row in 1978 after being out of prison only a short time after spending a six-year term for another slaying. The recess and executions across the country had lulled him into believing escaping the chair would be fairly easy. I didn't believe the first one would ever take place, but it has, so, so I don't really know. 
Why didn't you believe the first one would really take place? Well, uh, I just thought that this thing of the past, you know, death penalty and stuff like that. I thought people were more, more humane, I guess you'd say. Why do you think things have changed so? Well, probably a civilized society, right? Take it for granted that it death penalty was something like that. Records at the Alabama Prison Project show already there's been 11 executions in the U.S. since the 1st of 1984. There were only five in 1983. Prison officials say it's unknown when another death sentence will be carried out in the state of Alabama because all 70 cases are on appeal. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News on death row in Holman Prison. The passing of the colors, a simple act that signifies a lot. It officially marks a change of command. Lieutenant General Charles Cleveland is giving up the command he's held for the past three years to General Richards. General Cleveland not only gave up his command, but a way of life he's known for the past 35 years. He retired today and did it in style. Cleveland was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal, and his wife received a Certificate of Appreciation from the Air Force for outstanding service over the years. The man who presented the awards, Air Force Chief of Staff General Charles Grable, praised General Cleveland in a ceremony before the change of command for the great improvements that have been made at Air University. At that same ceremony, General Richards received his third star from General Grable and pledged to continue General Cleveland's work. I will continue the great leadership that uh, General Cleveland and Fran I've given to the Air University, and I look forward to working with all of you. With General Cleveland staying in Montgomery to head up the United Way, the change of command doesn't mean the city has lost a general. It's just welcomed another. Don Phelps, WSFA TV News on the Military Beat. Net effect is, I think there has to be some understanding between rural America and urban America of the needs of rural America and the problems that they face if, in fact, we're going to continue to maintain the most advanced food and fiber production and marketing system that has ever existed on the face of the earth.
uh, during the process of handling the evidence, it became missing. Now, we have reason to believe or, or we suspect that maybe the uh, driver of the vehicle may have walked off with it for whatever reason. And it uh, was error on our part that the evidence was allowed to lay around in such fashion that it could be obtained. We have a strong case regardless that uh, we can convict the driver if, if the grand jury decides to do so. But uh, it's most unfortunate that evidence is missing, but it's one of those things that uh, you just can't help. We do not believe that the 1976 letter is legal and binding. We have agreed to abide by it. We will abide by it, but our disagreement is with it being declared a legal binding contract. Well, we uh, made the allegations based upon the testimony of Mr. Stano in the last court hearing. Uh, that was the substance of the evidence that we had. We hoped to discover further evidence through the lawful civil discovery methods. Uh, the judge did not allow us to do that. We're a little bit disappointed in that, but we're also very delighted with his ruling. Ward was uh, convicted, uh, I understand, for 10 or 15 counts of interstate transportation of motor vehicles in Florida. And at this time, uh, from my understanding, is he's on a work release program, federal work release program, out of Dauphin here. <laughs> I'm 16, the drugs I did are pot, alcohol, hash, ups, downs, acid, and cocaine. This story is not new to Dr. Miller-Newton. He's treated about 3,200 teenage drug users in the past five years, and he's seen the problem firsthand with his own son. The drug use begins under peer pressure as a way of coping. But at that point, the growing up process for that kid stops. I mean, it freezes, and a kid uses drugs to take care of coping. And from that moment on, the dependence, the loss of control is rapid and overwhelming. 
It can end in death. It just got to the point where I would rather have been dead. You know, I, all the time, I'd find some way to try to kill myself. Much of what Dr. Newton says is aimed at parents, helping them realize that what might seem to be normal adolescent behavior may actually be a clue to drug use. Although no one of us knew she was doing the drugs, we, it was just a, the extreme bad attitude and temper. Dr. Newton says recovery is possible, but treatment must key on ending the psychological dependence for drugs. The real work of recovery begins after the body is clean, where you start to deal with the craving of the psyche and the soul for the substance as a way to feel good and to live. Cal Calloway, WSFA TV News, so Dothan. Kids getting into drugs because of low self-esteem. I think our schedule is conducive to have, being on television a lot because we place, you know, a lot of the top teams in the country. We played seven teams that went to bowl games last year. And, um, of course, the Miami game for, for sure is going to be on television. I would think that the Texas game would be on. And certainly, you know, when we play uh, Tennessee, Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Florida State, they're going to be attractive games to the television audience. The jurors were asked only to decide how much money Daryl Pruitt should get from the city of Montgomery. Judge Thompson already decided the city is responsible for shooting Pruitt. So a doctor testified Pruitt's leg is partially and permanently paralyzed because of the shooting. Pruitt can't walk without a leg brace. I'm pleased that they awarded him $100,000. I, I think that's fair compensation. I'm, I'm just happy about it. I'm not surprised that the verdict's that high because we were not able to say anything. Attorneys for the city said they were working under unusual restraints because they couldn't say anything in court about the facts or the circumstances of the shooting. We have not been allowed yet to tell our version of how it occurred. In fact, the judge ruled we couldn't even make reference to where it happened, even, other than a place on Fairview Avenue. The city attorney says a jury never got to hear that the police officer was investigating a burglary and feared for his life when he shot Pruitt. But Pruitt's attorney says the city had its chance a few years ago in another court case when Judge Thompson warned the city to change its policy on the use of deadly force. Uh, the city of Montgomery cannot continue to ignore uh, the rulings of the federal court and, uh, and expect not to have to pay for those rulings, for, the, for that, that action, and in, in, in this case, in hard cash. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News at the federal courthouse. <laughs> The first Class A 2A All-Star football game may have been for small school players, but they play their football in a very big way. The South scored first after Todd Johnson hooked up with Darrell Pearson on a 63-yard gain. It was 8-0 South. After a Darrell Sidman field goal, the North took the lead on Anthony Looney's one-yard run. Looney, the star of the game for the North as he rushed for 117 yards. The South's big-name ball carrier, Leo Jolly, dashed 19 yards to put his team up 14 to 11 with 5.36 left in the first half. And a little razzle-dazzle by the South put them up 20 to 11 at the half. Robert Carter flipped a 44-yard halfback option pass to Darrell Pearson, the South's outstanding performer in the game. But what a finish. The North throw 55 yards in the last five minutes of play. Darrell Stidman of Hackleburg High School was true on a 19-yard field goal with just three seconds left. The North wins it 21 to 20. I'm out of a voice and a steak dinner, and a very disappointed Dave Cody reporting from Auburn tonight.
Let's do that. We're representing uh, the entire Air Force and, uh, and really our community because the community and Air University are so close that uh, uh, we're just showing that uh, another side of the military life, if you will. Tony Curry is president of the Atlanta Resource Center. She works with companies setting up EAPs, employee assistance programs, to fight alcohol and drug abuse. She blames the use of chemicals for 60 to 70 percent of all job performance problems. She says there are signs of drug use employers can look for. Unauthorized leave, <coughs> where they just uh, take off long lunch hours or they leave early in the afternoon or they come in late unauthorized leave where it just seems like just when the supervisor needs them the most they're not there the results <laughs> of drug use are just as evident always being late for work always leaving early taking long breaks Ms. curry says supervisors are the key to recovery she says they should not cover up for their workers not covering up for the alcoholic employee enabling that person to get sicker. It only, it only gets that person that much closer to death. Her and advice is to confront the worker well, in a caring way. The decision to get treatment can only be made by the worker. We give the employee a firm choice. It's always a choice. Uh, and even if the choice is seek help or seek a job, it is still a choice. But generally, the job leverage alone is enough to get an alcoholic to agree to go into treatment because that's the money. In most cases, workers return to the job recovered. But she warns EAPs can only work with the support of management. If the top management is not supported and behind it, it really does uh, filter down and is, and is diffused a lot, and there's not a lot of strength in the program. Cal Calloway, WSFA TV News, Dothan. Not to create these barriers many farmers today are finding it tough making a living that's an understatement but as more and more farmers and their wives attend conferences and seminars they learn how to get the most for their money and find out how they may be losing money the key is efficiency in buying feeding and selling cows and hogs 30-year-old Ronnie like Jones, who's been in the farming business for eight years, right says efficiency and holds and the key to a promising future for him and, and other farmers. And uh, we just, we've got to be more efficient. That's the biggest, that's the biggest thing. The, the margin for waste and all is, is gone, and it's more efficient uh, in everything we do because the profit just isn't there right now to, to, to guess and wonder what's going to happen. Jones says Alabama is a feed deficiency state. He says a lot of cattle are shipped away to the Midwest to be fed, then brought back to be sold. So what farmers must learn is how to produce a good feed crop. 
the main topic in the beef seminar. With talk of higher beef prices next year for hamburger, steak, and the like, farmers are learning all they can to avoid passing on increases in costs for us. The predictions are we're going to have a better year next year. We've been saying that for several years and thinking that, you know. Uh, I think what we're trying to do here is get people together to learn how to be a little more efficient in the cattle business and make the best out of what has been a poor situation. Maybe we're going to improve some. So that's mainly what you're learning today, how to be more efficient? Yes. We're going out now to a feedlot and uh, look at some new feeding programs all. Maybe if you can just pick up a few good ideas along the line, maybe it'll help you be more competitive in the face situation. Today is the final day of the conference. Farmers seem to be impressed with all that they have learned. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News. About this time of year, people are tying the knot all over Alabama, but never before have Alabamians had a chance to see holy matrimony on ice, complete with a skating groom and bride. Hundreds came to see two Montgomerians, Lieutenant Colonel Rick Dahl and Madeline Robinson, join hands and lives on ice. For some, this public ice ceremony will be remembered as their first wedding. For others, it brought back memories. Do you promise to forsake all others and cleave unto her and to her only until, until death you depart? I do. And after Rick kissed his bride and the crowd cheered, the dolls skated onto the ice. Madeline threw her bouquet to one side of the rink and Rick threw the garter out to the other side. We met on the ice and became friends and skating buddies on the ice and it seemed only natural that after that we just get married on the ice. And where will this skating couple spend their honeymoon? Why at the National Skating Couples Competition in Dallas, competing for the first time as husband and wife. Lisa Walsh, WSFA TV News. It's a, it's a very tough race, 500 miles here this Sunday is uh, because of the weather. You run a car wide open here, you can, literally, you can literally run a car to death here. So you gotta kinda pace yourself. You gotta keep that in the back of your mind all the time. When you start racing with people and you're holding the throttle wide open, lap after lap after lap, you gotta make yourself quit doing that. You, you gotta stay in the lead draft, but you gotta breathe the car every now and then. So it's really, a deal that you got to use your head a lot to win this race.